Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto. Dr. Savory's many honors include <coughs> being Vice President of the Middle East Studies Association of North America and Secretary, Secretary of Academy II of the Royal Society of, of, uh, of Canada. He is a graduate of Oxford University and the University of London, and Dr. Savory's interest in Islamic history has inspired many books, including Introduction to Islamic Civilization and a recent book which we talked about this evening, um, which is Iran under the Safavids, which I believe is going to be in the bookstore fairly recently, or fairly, fairly soon. He was also editorial secretary of the English edition of the Encyclopedia of Islam, which I believe is a mammoth publication incorporating material from many international sources. And he did that before taking up his present position with the University of Toronto. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Savory. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Quinn. There's only one correction I would like to make. I'm happy to say I'm no longer chairman of the department. Of, uh, <laughs> I was all asked to uh, talk about the relationship between Islam and politics uh, with special emphasis on Iran. So I propose to just uh, say a few words about the uh, <coughs> traditional Islamic worldview, and then move to a consideration of the uh, special problem of uh, religion and politics uh, in Iran. And I'd like to start with a quotation from uh, a lecture which was given by Bernard Lewis in the course of a, uh, a series of lectures delivered at Indiana University in 1963. He, wrote, he said then, of all the great movements that have shaken the Middle East during the last century and a half, the Islamic movements alone are authentically Middle Eastern in inspiration. Liberalism and fascism, patriotism and nationalism, communism and socialism are all European in origin, however much adapted and transformed by Middle Eastern disciples. The religious orders alone spring from the native soil and express the passions of the submerged masses of the population. Though they have all so far been defeated, they have not yet spoken their last word. Now these words, spoken by Professor Lewis in 1963, have assumed, I think you'll agree, a new significance in the light of the continuing convulsions in Iran, the sectarian strife in Syria, Iraq, the Lebanon, Turkey, and other parts of the Middle East, and the growing strength of Muslim fundamentalism in Egypt, Libya, Pakistan, and elsewhere. Well, since the revolution in Iran in January and February 1979, it has been virtually impossible to pick up a news magazine without finding in it an article on militant Islam, or the resurgence of Islamic fundamentalism, or some similar topic. And the inference to be drawn from this is that the West has been taken by surprise by this revival of Islam, a revival which is expressed not only in religious, but also in political terms, because there is no dichotomy in the Islamic tradition between religion and politics. Yet those who have a longer historical perspective than the average journalist or politician will see recent events in the Middle East as just one more change in position in the seesaw of the power struggle between the two great rival civilizations, Islam and what is loosely called the West, although the West may for certain purposes include Japan, as well as the countries of Western Europe and North America, and usually includes one country which is actually in the Middle East itself, namely Israel. A much clearer and more accurate division of the world is provided by the traditional Islamic worldview, which divides the world into Dar al-Islam the House of Islam, and Dar al-Harb, the House of War. And as defined by Kenneth Cragg, an eminent authority on Islam, Dar al-Islam is, quote, territory in which Islam is in full devotional, political, and legal actuality, end of quote. 
and Dar al Harb, the house of war, constitutes, quote, the areas of mankind as yet unsubdued by Islam. Well, as Professor Lewis and many other authorities have noted, from its birth, the Islamic religion was the chief contender with Christianity for the hearts of men. Islamic civilization was the nearest neighbor and deadliest rival of European Christendom. And for 13 and a half centuries, relations between the two religions and cultural systems have assumed the nature of a Cold War at best. During not inconsiderable periods of history, the latent hostility between the two systems has erupted into open conflict. And it's impossible to understand the violent cross currents at present racking the Islamic world without some knowledge of the Islamic view of the world and of the tradition of classical Islam which has shaped and molded the thoughts and lives of Muslims for over 13 centuries. Indeed, many of the problems which beset the Middle East today and which complicate relations between it and the West derive from the conflict between this classical Islamic tradition and attempts by leaders of Muslim states to effect policies of modernization and social reform. Of course, Islam has three principal aspects. Islam is a religion, Islam is a system of law and tradition, and Islam is state and empire. As a religion, Islam regards itself as the final and most perfect revelation of God to man. As the Quran, chapter 5, verse 5 says, This day have I perfected your religion for you, and completed my favor unto you, and have chosen for you as religion, Islam. Now, Islam means literally submission to the will of God. A Muslim, therefore, is essentially a person whose whole life is lived in conformity to the divine will. It is therefore a term which in its widest sense could be used by all monotheists, as Professor Guillaume noted. The prophet Muhammad is regarded as the seal of the prophets, that is to say, the last of a line of prophets starting from Abraham and including Jesus. It follows that Muslims regard the other great monotheistic religions which originated in the Middle East, Judaism and Christianity, as inferior and superseded. Anyone who refused to accept Islam was branded as a kafir, that's to say one who had shown his ingratitude to God by rejecting the revelation brought by his messenger Muhammad. The term therefore came to mean infidel or non-Muslim. But the Prophet Muhammad was not only the messenger of God, the mouthpiece of God's revelation to man, namely the Quran, but he was also the leader of the first Muslim community, or Ummah, as it's called in Arabic, and its first lawgiver and arbitrator in disputes which arose within that community. And after Muhammad's death, the caliphs, the English word caliph derives from the Arabic khalifa, which simply means successor. The caliphs exercised political and administrative authority, though not, of course, the religious authority of the prophet. And they were also, to a large extent, the lawgivers of the community. On what basis were they to exercise judicial authority? The first and obvious source of such authority was the Quran itself. But the Quran, as Professor Fazlur Rahman noted, is primarily a book of religious and moral principles and exhortations and is not a legal document. To supplement it, the early Muslims incorporated into the Islamic tradition the ancient Arab idea of sunnah, which means precedent or normative custom. And in its Islamic guise, it assumed the form of the sunnah of the prophet, that is to say, the example or practice and behavior of the prophet. The sunnah of the prophet was handed down in the form of what were called hadith, that's to say, accounts of an action, utterance, or decision of Muhammad. And so those who follow this sunnah, and they constitute the majority of Muslims today, are termed Sunni Muslims. 
when faced with making a decision on an issue on which the Quran and the Sunnah gave no clear or unequivocal precedent, Muslim jurisprudence were allowed to use what was called reasoning by analogy, which became the third basis of Islamic law. And finally, as the generation of those who had actually known the Prophet passed from the scene, no new generation as such was thought capable of engendering new Sunnah. And so recourse, therefore, was had to a fourth and much ampler source of law, what was called ejma, or consensus. And this was founded on the conviction that the Muslim community, the Islamic community, would never agree upon an error. And so ijma, in effect, entrusted the enlargement of the law to the collective fidelity. And innovation, a concept always close to heresy in Islam, would, it was thought, be saved from excess, from pretension, from distortion, if it commended itself in the long run to the whole household of the faith. Well, by the beginning of the 10th century AD, this whole structure of Islamic law, known collectively as the Sharia, that's to say the way or path which, if followed by man, will lead him to God, had been systematized in its final form. At that point, scholars of all schools felt that on all essential questions, consensus had been reached, and that henceforth the promulgation of new ideas on the exposi exposition of the relevant texts of the Quran and Hadith were as good as forbidden. The right of individual interpretation, or edge to hard, was in theory and very largely in practice also confined to the points on which no general agreement had yet been reached. And this closing of the door of edge to hard, as it was called, amounted to the demand for what was called taklid, a term which now came to mean the unquestioning acceptance of the doctrines of established schools and authorities. Well, why is the system of Islamic law, the Sharia, so important in any consideration of recent trends in Islam? And I'd like to quote from Joseph Schacht, uh, who summed this up very succinctly. He said, Islamic law is the epitome of Islamic thought, the most typical manifestation of the Islamic way of life, the core and kernel of Islam itself. The very term for jurisprudence in Arabic, fiqh, meaning knowledge, shows that early Islam regarded knowledge of the sacred law as the knowledge par excellence. Theology has never been able to achieve a comparable importance in Islam. Only mysticism was strong enough to challenge the ascendancy of the law over the mind of Muslims and often prove victorious. But even at the present time, the law, including its legal subject matter, remains an important, if not the most important, element in the struggle which is being fought in Islam between traditionalism and modernism under the impact of Western ideas. It is impossible to understand Islam without understanding Islamic law. Well, the third aspect of Islam, the traditional, uh, the, the tradition of classical Islam, which I mentioned, is Islam as state and empire. And I noted that in the Islamic tradition, there is, in theory, no separation between religion and politics, between what is called in the Christian tradition, church and state, between what medieval Christendom called regnum, the realm of the king, and sacerdotium, the realm of the priest. And as Bernard Lewis has noted, such pairs of words as spiritual and temporal, lay and ecclesiastical, religious and secular, have no equivalence in the classical languages of the Muslim peoples. Whereas Christ exhorted his followers to render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, Islam was involved with political power from the start. In Islam, the state provides the frame within which Islam, with its demands on the community of believers, that's to say the ummah, and on the individual Muslim, must be lived. Well, Muhammad, as I mentioned, was succeeded as the head of the first Muslim community or state at Medina by a long line of caliphs, 
who were the titular heads of the Islamic Empire until this was extinguished by the Mongols in 1258. And one of the classic formulations of the functions of the caliph was that of al-Mawardi, who died in 1058 AD. The defense and maintenance of religion, the decision of legal disputes, the protection of the territory of Islam, the punishment of wrongdoers, the provision of troops for guarding the frontiers, the waging of jihad or holy war against those who refuse to accept Islam or submit to Muslim rule, the organization and collection of taxes, the payment of salaries and the administration of public funds, the appointment of competent officials, and lastly, personal attention to the details of government. But by the time, even by the time al mawardi was writing, by the 10th uh, century, 11th uh, uh, century AD, practice had widely departed from theory. Temporal rulers styling themselves Amir or Sultan had stripped the caliph of most of his political, military, and administrative powers and left him little beyond a symbolic function as the defender of the faith who legitimized the rule of these emirs and sultans. And with the aim of preserving the institution of the caliphate and thus the unity of the Islamic State, the jurists were prepared to go to great lengths to accommodate juridical theory to political reality in order to preserve the unity of the Islamic State, which was in their minds the most important consideration of all, the jurists were even prepared to condone the usurpation of the prerogatives of the caliph by emirs and sultans. Even tyranny, said the jurists, was preferable to anarchy. And so we get a lot of hadith along the following lines. Sixty years of an unjust imam are better than one night without a sultan. And the jurists, by thus clothing what they called the emirate by seizure with the appearance of legality, eventually saved the principle of unity in the Islamic State by the device of a sort of concordat, the caliph recognizing the governor's sole control of pol policy and administration in return for his own dignity and right of administration of religious affairs. And nearly all the theoretical discussions on power, on the question of power in an Islamic state, ultimately made reference to the key Quranic text, chapter 4, verse 59, or 62 in another edition, which reads as follows, O ye who believe, obey God and obey his messenger and those who are in authority among you. An Islamic state is therefore made up of persons whose ultimate allegiance is to God, to whom alone sovereignty belongs. Again, as the Quran says, chapter 3, verse 27, Say, O God, Lord of sovereignty, thou givest sovereignty to whomsoever thou pleasest, and thou takest away sovereignty from whomsoever thou pleasest. So in view of this, the concept of the sovereignty of the people, which is enshrined in most Western democratic constitutions, is not acceptable to the Muslim. The other essential criterion of an Islamic state is that the Sharia, the religious law of Islam, shall be the law of the land. Indeed, it is the first duty of an Islamic state to enforce the religious law. Again, this has Quranic authority. Those who do not judge by what God has revealed, those indeed are the evildoers, chapter 5, verse 47. No legislation must contravene the Quran and the Sunnah, Whenever God and his apostle have decided a matter, it is not for a faithful man or woman to follow another course of his or her own choice. Quran 33, 37. So these two fundamental principles of an Islamic state have proved stumbling blocks to would-be modernizers and reformers. But Islam is not a monolithic structure any more than is Christianity. And I'd like to turn now to a consideration of that aspect of Islam which has become the official religion in Iran, namely Ithna Ashari or Twelver Shiism. 
As I mentioned earlier, the majority of Muslims, called Sunnis, because they follow the Sunnah or practice of the Prophet, believe that Muhammad died without designating a successor, and they accept the authority of a line of caliphs or successors of the Prophet chosen initially from among the leaders of the Muslim community. But Shi'i Muslims, however, believe that Muhammad, before his death, designated Ali, his son-in-law and cousin, as his successor. And after the death of Muhammad in 632 AD and the election of Abu Bakr as the first caliph, Ali's supporters formed what was called the Shi'at Ali, which means simply the party of Ali, and thus became known as Shi'i Muslims. Now this Sunni Shi'i schism had the most profound consequences for the whole of subsequent Islamic history and the hostility between the two sects is still apparent in many parts of the Muslim world today. One need only mention the attempts by Khomeini to subvert other Muslim states in the Middle East in which power is in the hands of Sunnis, the current war between Iran and Iraq, and the feuds between Sunnis and Shi'is in Turkey, Syria, and the Lebanon. Many Muslims today, for political reasons, try to play down the antipathy between Sunni and Shi'i, but arguments of this type belong to the realm of apologetics and have no basis in historical fact. Well, Ali eventually became the fourth caliph, but Shi'is continued to regard the first three caliphs and all the caliphs who succeeded Ali as the titular heads of the Islamic world for six centuries as usurpers. In the Shi'i view, Ali and his 11 descendants in the male line who are termed imams are the embodiment of the Shi'i concept of the ruler. It is the imam and only the imam who is entitled to direct the faithful. And so from its inception, the Shi'i movement was a party in opposition to the regime in power. Instead of giving their loyalty to the ruling Sunni caliphs, Shi'is gave their allegiance to the imams. Well, in the course of time, Shi'i theologians attributed to the imams various distinctive characteristics designed to demonstrate the superiority of the Shi'i imam over the Sunni caliph. And these characteristics have no parallel in Sunni Islam. The most important of them are the doctrine of isma, or that's to say the sinlessness or infallibility of the imams, and the function of the imams as intercessors through the redemptive nature of the suffering and martyrdom of the imams. Two of these were added after the year 873 AD when the 12th Imam disappeared from earth and went into occultation, the messianic theory of the second coming of the 12th Imam, who is also known as the hidden Imam, the Lord of the Age, the Imam of the Epoch, and the Mahdi. And the second coming of the Mahdi will be portended by various eschatological signs and will herald the day of judgment and the end of the world. His reappearance will enable human society to reach true perfection and the full realization of spiritual life. The Mahdi will fill with justice the world that has been corrupted by injustice and iniquity. Well, the occultation of the 12th Imam in 873 AD posed a serious problem for the Shi'i community. According to Shi'i theory, government belongs rightfully to the Imam. Who, therefore, was to govern the Shi'i community after the disappearance of the 12th Imam? The consensus among Shi'is was that the mujtahids, that is to say, the most eminent Shi'i jurists of the time, should act as the representatives on earth of the hidden Imam. This remains the Shi'i view today and has received emphatic endorsement by Khomeini. From the moment of its inception in the 7th century AD, the Shi'i movement, as I said, was in opposition to and frequently in revolt against the government of the day, which was a Sunni government. It was often a persecuted group. And as a result of persecution, Shi'ism acquired martyrs. The most celebrated of these is the third Imam, Hussein, who was slain at Karbala in Iraq in 680 AD by the troops of the Sunni Caliph Yazid. And for 1,300 years since Karbala, on the anniversary of the death of Hussein, his death has been commemorated 
by uh, morning processions and by the performance of uh, a cycle of what are called ta'zir or um, miracle plays. Those who take part in the morning processions slash themselves with knives and flagellate themselves with chains in order to demonstrate the overwhelming nature of their grief. And during the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, this Shi'i obsession with martyrdom was strengthened still further by the constant acquisition of new martyrs. And for a time, there was a self-perpetuating cycle of 40-day periods of ritual mourning. So to sum up the three primary characteristics of 12 Shiism, opposition, martyrdom, and revolt are essentially negative. They do not constitute a basis for rational government, still less for progressive or democratic government. Well, in 1501, for the first time in the history of Iran, the Shi'i form of Islam became the official religion of the Iranian state. with the accession of a dynasty called the Safavid dynasty. But in the absence of the hidden imam, the government of a Shi'i state belonged in theory not to the Shah, but to the representatives of the hidden imam on earth, namely the Mujtahids. So in terms of Shi'i theory, the Shah was a usurper. Many of the Mujtahids conceded the Shah's right to rule only with reluctance, and their latent hostility to the regime remained. The majority, however, were prepared to accommodate theory to reality because they realized that even if they ceded to the Shah the right to govern, their power in a Shi'i state would still be far greater than it had been in Sunni states in which they had been in opposition to the regime. So the Safavids used institutionalized Shi'ism to maintain their power. Well, this policy, of course, was fraught with danger, for it inevitably brought into sharp relief the innate contradiction in a Shi'i state between the authority of the Mujtahids as the representatives of the hidden imam, to whom government was held rightfully to belong, and that of the Shah. For almost 200 years, however, the Safavid Shahs, by a series of pragmatic policies of considerable ingenuity, managed to avoid a major confrontation with the Mujtahids. The Sadr, the head of the religious institution, was the key figure in this process. The Safavid Shahs, by making the Sadr a political appointee, charged with ensuring that the religious classes remain subject to political direction hoped to maintain their ascendancy over the religious classes in general, and in particular, over the Mujtahids. In this aim, they were on the whole successful down to the end of the 17th century. The Huguenot jeweler, Jean Chardin, who was present at the coronation of one of the Safavid Shahs, Shah Suleiman, in 1666, has left us the following shrewd assessment of the situation. The clergy, he said, and all the holy men of Iran consider that rule by laymen was established by force and usurpation and that civil government belongs by right to the church. But the more generally held opinion is that royalty, albeit in the hands of laymen, derives its institution and its authority from God, that the king takes the place of God and the prophets in the government of the people that the Sad and all other practitioners of the religious law should not interfere with the political institution, that their authority is subject to that of the king, even in matters of religion. This latter opinion prevails. The former opinion is held only by the clergy and those whom they su supervise. The king and his ministers close the mouths of the clergy as it pleases them and force the clergy to obey them in everything. In this way, the spiritual is at the moment completely subordinate to the temporal. Well, that was the picture in 1666. But the second and perhaps even more important way in which the Safavid Shahs kept the Mujtahids under control 
was by usurping the prerogative of the latter to be the representatives of the hidden imam upon earth. By means of two centuries of brilliantly effective propaganda, they succeeded in convincing a majority of the Iranian population that their claim to be the representatives of the hidden imam and therefore their right to be the source of ultimate power in the state was better than that of the Mujtahids. They achieved this in the main by fabricating a genealogy dem demonstrating their descent from the seventh Shi'i imam. But astute though the policies of the Safavids were, they solved this fu fundamental problem of sovereignty in a, in a Shi'i state only on the level of real politique. The Safavid system worked well as long as the Shah maintained a strong hand at the helm. Under weak and ineffective Shahs, the Mujta heads tended to reassert their independence of the political institution. With the accession of the last Safavid Shah, Shah Sultan Hussein in 1694, this potential threat to the stability of the Safavid state became a reality. Shah Sultan Hussein, who was derisively dubbed Mullah Hussein because of his subservience to the Mujtahids, lost control of the religious institution. And the greatly enhanced prestige of the Mujtahids in the administration of the state was reflected in the creation of a new office, that of Chief Mullah, Mullah Boshi. According to Amin Banani, some sources suggest direct religious rule by means of a concourse of Mujtahids above the monarch.